Eric, we can, we can continue. Yes, we can continue. Very good. So <clears throat> now hmm, we change a little the topic. And uh, if you have, if you can see the page 11, so another topic which is very important in the mathematical analysis or in the calculus. So is the notion of the geometric progression. So you can imagine if you take if you take some number A and another number R, which is strictly positive, then you can write the so-called geometric progression as A, <coughs> then A multiplied by R, then A multiplied by A square, then A multiplied by R cube, and so on. So, for example, if you take a 1 over 2, or maybe it is more clear, if you take a equals 1 and r equals 1 over 2, then you have the progression 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 4, 1 over 8, 1 over 16, and so on. So, you have, in this progression, you have two numbers, important numbers. So, the term of uh, the number A and uh, the common, we say that R is the common ratio. So, A is the start value, start value of our progression, and R, which is positive, is a common ratio. But you see, it is it is also possible to take R something like minus one over two. And R and A are something like one. So you will have a progression uh, with the terms of different sign, different sign. It is also possible. So in general, in general, uh, the form of our geometric progression is given by uh, the formula. 2.1. Then you see here in this formula I have one, two, three, four, and so on. Then I can write the nth term, the nth term of my progression as a product of my of my start value A multiplied by my common ratio to the power n minus 1. So A n is equal to A multiplied by R to the power n minus 1. And it is, it is, it's true for any, for any n you see, in my notes, we say n is an integer, but here I will say that n is really is really a natural value. So you see, is it clear as for the definition of the geometric progression? Yeah. So yeah, you have. You have a starting value, you have a common ratio, and in the in the 
in the way 2.1 or in the following formula for the nth for the nth term of this progression you have that a n is a multiplied by r to the power n minus one the next step which is rather interesting which is rather interesting before the limit to see the limits we will see later but now some auxiliary result we want to find we want to find the sum the sum of my progression in fact in the following in the following theorem in the following theorem page 12 can you see this there uh, yeah good you can see very good so if i have if i have a progression given by the formula 2.1 then I can find I can find the sum of the of n first terms uh, of this progression. Uh, this sum is defined by S sub n, and this sum is given by the formula two point two. So the sum of the first n terms of my progression is a so the so the start value of my progression multiplied by one minus r to the power n divided by one minus r and here in the formula 2.3 i recall that the sum of the, the sum of the first n terms of my progression is in fact a multiplied by r to the power zero so r multiplied by one plus a multiplied by r the power of one and so on a multiplied by r to the power n minus one so the question is the question is it's for you because as for the examination it's a usual question to know how to find the sum how in order in order to find the sum how to prove the formula 2.2 .2. you see it is rather easy but you have to know this because for your examination it is important because in in future we will uh, use this formula uh, i will i will not say it now as for the situation as for the situation as for the limit as n goes to infinity so only only a finite number of terms so please turn the page and then then let us let us prove this formula 2.2 okay so if we consider uh the formula the formula for s capital s sub n given by 2.3 then you see you see let us multiply let us multiply this formula 2.3 by the value of one minus r 
it's possible. Why not? So we see the formula. The one minus r multiplied by the sum from k one to n of a r to the power k minus one k minus one is the following is the following relation one minus r multiplied by a r to the point or to the power zero plus a to the r to the power one and so on a r to the power to the power n minus one then multiply these two brackets we will have immediately that this sum this sum is in fact a minus a multiplied by r to the power n is it clear for you because because we can cancel all the intermediate terms if you want so we have we have in this formula only the first term minus the last term. So a minus a multiplied by r to the power n. And we suppose here, we suppose that in our progression, uh, the common ratio is different from one different from one. So finally, from this formula, we have our desired, desired result 2.2. Questions? Can you, do you have questions? No, no I think everything's understandable. Is it clear? Yeah, I think it's clear. It's clear. I want to hear the answer from other people. Yes, clear. Clear. Very good. Very good. Thank you. So, you you have to know this about the geometric progression, and then we pass uh, to another topic, which is important for the real world. Is for the real values and also <clears throat> for our future work. So page number 14. We, I want to introduce for you uh, the so-called method of mathematical induction. From this page 14, you see, here is a definition which says that it is a technique uh, for proving results for establishing statements for natural numbers. So, the idea. You have some inequality or some equality, or I don't know what, depending on a natural number n so i want to prove this equality inequality for for all natural n you see how to do this how to do this so in the definition of this method we have in fact two steps we have two steps so the first step or in mathematics, uh, we say the base step. We want to prove a statement for the initial value. You see, usually, and in your in your in your work, you will see that uh, we start usually from n equals one from n equals one, but 
In fact, it is not necessary because we can we can have some statement which are which hold true for n greater than three, two, four, I don't know what. So in our in our exercise. We will start usually from n equals one. You see, but it is not necessary. So in the definition, page 14, you see, we say we say about a an initial value, an initial value. So in our case, it will be maybe, maybe, usually n equals one, but it is not a general rule, so it may be, it can be n equals two or three, I don't know. This depends, you see. The second step, the second step, we say, I suppose, you see, I suppose that the statement, my statement, the equality or inequality is true for n's iteration. This means I suppose that this statement is true for some number n. Then if I can prove that this statement is also true for n plus one iteration then this statement is true for for all natural n is it clear the idea the idea so i repeat i repeat here that we have two main steps the first step is for example if i take my initial value n equals one, then my my statement, which depends on on natural n, is true for n equals one. It's the first step. The base the base of induction. Then uh, I suppose that. This statement is true for n equals, for example, n equals k. And finally, I have to prove that this statement will be true for n equals k plus 1. It's the idea of this method. Is it clear? For the moment, I say only the yes, words. It's clear. I, I say only some words. Now we will see how it works. How it works. So you see, page 15, it's exactly the same thing I've said. So our, our work is to some some exercises using this this method. So page sixteen. We have exercise number nine. The exercise sum number nine. So you have a sum which is defined by the formula three point one. The sum. 1 plus 3 plus 5, so on, 2, n minus 1. We claim that this sum, this sum is in fact n square. How do you, so we want, in this, in this case, we want to use the method of the mathematical induction. So the first step, it is necessary to prove that this statement 3.1 is valid 
So n equals 1. If n equals 1, on the left hand side we have 1. Okay. And on the right hand side we have 1 to 1 square. This means 1. So for n equals 1, our statement 3.1 is true. Is it clear? Yes, it's clear. Clear. Very well. So, the second step. In fact, if you if you turn the page and you can see at the page 15 that we have the second step, the second step, which consists of two of two parts. So first of all, I have to suppose, I have to assume that our statement is true for n equals k. And then using this result, using this result, I have to show that this result is also valid for n equals k plus 1. You see? So we turn the page, page 16. So I I will assume I will assume that for n equals k we have our formula 3.1. This means that 1 plus 3 plus 5 so on 2k minus 1 is k square. You see, I re if you want, roughly speaking. I repeat my formula 3.1, but in terms of k. You see, it's the same thing. Exactly the same thing. I change a n by k. But it's my assumption. I suppose that this fact is true. Now, now, I have to prove that it is also true if I take n equals k plus 1. So I write, I write the sum from 1 to, you see the formula, the formula, 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus so on, 2 multiply it by k plus 1 minus 1. You see, here in the formula 3.1, I change my n by k plus 1. Mm -hmm. You see? Yeah. It's clear. So if I rewrite my sum, so first of all, I have something from my assumption. So this sum from 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus so on to k minus 1, and an additional term which comes from the fact that I suppose that n is k plus 1 is 2k plus 1, okay? So the first term, the sum of the first term, term by my assumption is k squared plus an additional term 2k plus 1. So this sum is it clear or not? I will ask the question, but 
the sum of k square plus 2k plus 1 is k plus 1 square. Is it clear? Uh -huh, yeah. Is it clear, the guys and the girls? Yes. Yes. Really? Yeah, it's clear. Yes, it is clear. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, you see, using the method, we prove the formula 3.1. So, I repeat, we start by the initial value. In this case, the initial value, value of n is 1. So, for, for n equals 1, everything is fine. Then, then I suppose that my 3.1 is true for n equals k. This means, you see, this means that in this formula 3.1, I replace my n by k. So I can write the formula in terms of k. It is an assumption. I assume that this equality is true. Okay? Then our goal, our goal is to prove that this equality 3.1 is also valid for n equals k plus 1. So you see, if I replace, if I replace n by k plus 1, I will see the, the equality which is written after the words. Now we have to prove that, you see? Then, in fact, the left-hand side of this equality is written after, after the words we have to point. So we have, first of all, the first sum due to our assumption is k square. And the last term in this sum is 2k plus 1. So I hope you know that a plus b square is a square plus 2ab plus b square. It is exactly the same thing here. So I have said. My sum is couple, uh, k plus 1 square. What it is our desired formula, 3 plus 3.1, but in the case, n equals k plus 1. So this means that my formula, our formula, 3.1 is valid for any or any natural n. So here we illustrate, <coughs> you know, illustrate uh, the method of mathematical induction uh, in this rather simple case. Is it clear? Uh, uh -huh. If you have some questions, Joel. K is the room place for N, yes? The number of the position of the digit. You see, you see, the, the, really, I don't know, uh, but, okay. So, uh, first of all, you see, I replace N by K, and it is my assumption. I say that for N equals K, everything is fine okay i do not prove this i have to prove if it is fine for n equals k it will be also fine it will be also true for n equals k plus one you see
So the first step, uh, sometimes in um, the mathematical literature, you have, in fact, not two steps, but three steps. So in order to underline that the first step is good, the base, then we say the step number two, we assume that for n equals k, everything is fine. So the equality in this case is true. And then step number three, we have to prove that it is, uh, it is, it is true for n equals k plus one. You see? So in the English literature, they use, uh, the following, the following method. So we have only two steps, but, uh, in this second step, we have two things. First of all, our assumption and then our proof. You see? Yes, yes, I see. Okay, it's clear, I hope. So now, uh, so now we will have another, another, another exercise, page number 17. How to use this method of mathematical induction. Exercise number 10, page uh, 17. So we have, we have the formula 3.2, uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3 and so on, plus n minus 1 plus n equals n multiplied by n plus 1 divided by 2. So as usually, you see, as usually, the first, the first step is to verify that this equality holds true for n equals 1. So I take n equals 1 and I have on the left hand side, I have 1. And on the right hand side, I have 1 multiplied by 1 plus 1 divided by 2. This means 1 equals 1. So everything is fine. It's fine. And this is equality holds for n equals 1. Okay. Now, the second step as in the definition of the method. I suppose, I assume that the statement is true for n equals k. So you see if after the word hence, so in this equality, I replace the letter n by the letter k. In fact, the number n by the number k. But you see, it's my assumption. I assume that this equality holds true. Okay. Finally, finally, you see, I want, I want now to prove that if I have the previous equality for n equals k, I want to prove that this equality holds true if I replace a n by k plus 1. So from the formula 3.2, if I replace n by k plus 1, you will see the equality what we want to prove. Can you see this, this equality? 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus so on plus k plus k plus 1 equals k plus 1 multiplied by k plus 2 divided by 2. This equality we have to prove, we have to show. Okay? So 
we start by the left hand side of this equality. So I take the sum, you see, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus so on plus k plus k plus 1. We have, in fact, we have the sum of the first k term. We know that this sum from our assumption is k multiplied by k plus 1 divided by 2. Yes? Then, then. Yeah, sounds good. Clear. Then it is, it is easy to see that this sum is, in fact, k plus 1 multiplied by k plus 2 divided by 2. So the desired result, and uh, here we have to underline that our our formula 3.2 is valid for any nature of n beginning from n equals one. You see, for any n, for any nature of n, it's good, it's fine. This formula holds true. This formula is true. Is it clear? Yes, it's clear. Yeah. For all the people, I hope. Uh, yeah. For all the people, not. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. Good. Thank you very much. Now, now, <clears throat> maybe, maybe we will finish. Okay, we will see. Uh, page number 18. Uh, we have, we have, in this case, some inequality, not an equality like in the two previous, in two previous exercises, but an inequality which is known, which is known as uh, they are nearly inequality, and, and this inequality is given is given by uh, the formula three point three, page eighteen. Okay. So now, as usually, you see, as usually, we have the first step, n equals one. Step one. At this step, what do we have? The left hand side, 1 plus a to the power 1, because n equals 1. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, the right hand side is exactly 1 plus a multiplied by 1, because n is 1. Yeah. So 1 plus 1 is 1 plus 1, everything is fine, so for n equals 1, our inequality 3.3 equals 2, okay? Now, at the second step, first of all, we take n equals k, and we assume that for n equals k, our inequality 3.3 uh, holds. This means that in this inequality, I replace my letter n or my number n by my number k. So I suppose, I repeat this what that I suppose that. 1 plus a to the power k is greater than 1 plus k multiplied by a. 1 plus k a. Okay? Clear. Mm. It's my assumption. Clear, clear. It's clear. My assumption. You see? So now, after the words, now we have to prove that 
Now we have to prove that. We have to prove what? We have to prove our inequality 3.3 mm -hmm. for n equals k plus 1 mm -hmm. if capital letters, if, if I have that 1 plus a to the power k is greater or equals 1 plus k a. You see? So what can I write? I take the left hand side of my inequality. I start by the left hand side of my inequality in this case. So 1 plus a to the power k plus 1 is 1 plus a to the power k multiplied by 1 plus a. I hope that this passage is clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No problem because k is a natural number, for example. But OK, no comment. So as for the 1 plus a to the power k, Due to my assumption, I know that this term is greater than 1 plus Ka. It's our assumption. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And uh, I keep 1 plus A as a second term. So you have a product 1 plus Ka multiplied by. 1 plus a. So I can open the bracket and I write 1 plus ka plus a plus ka squared. So you see, in this sum, in this sum, you have 1 plus k plus 1 multiplied by a it is here we 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 make use of the first three terms in this sum you see but you have the fourth term k multiplied by a square <clears throat> but we know that k is a natural number so it's it is positive and a square is also positive. You see, is also positive. So, as a result, we have the inequality that one plus a to the power k plus one is greater or equals one plus k plus one multiplied by a. And this is exactly our desired inequality. So, conclusion, our Bernoulli inequality holds true, our Bernoulli inequality 3.3 .3 holds true for any n natural, for any natural n. So, we have proved our desired result or if you want our exercise or a theorem, a theorem, something like this, is it clear? Yes, it's clear. Yes, yes. Clear. yes. So, so now, now, I think we will finish in. Uh, 10 minutes, maybe in 10 minutes, because here we have an important topic. So we will have some introduction to this topic. And then please try to understand this. And next time we will start with this topic. I think you do not know this from your school program. So it is important because uh, maybe 
even the mathematical induction somebody knows no no mm, nobody not so much yeah okay but it it is rather easy uh what do you know about the geometric progression nothing yeah yes geometric yes ah so you know something Irrational numbers, I hope you know something about. But now, now, you turn your page, it will be page number 19, okay? And uh, I don't know, in your lectures, uh, you will have also the definition, the definition of this notion so first of all first of all i want to introduce i want to introduce <clears throat> the so-called bounded sets you see you can imagine you can imagine a closed interval for example, zero, one. So the interval, uh, the interval, which includes the points zero and one, all the real numbers from zero to one, you see? Then you can say that this set, which is an interval, closed interval, zero one is a bounded set this means what does it mean if you want if i take any element any number from this interval zero one this element will be less or equal to one is it clear? And any element, each element from this interval is greater or equals to zero. So if I denote, if I denote uh, the, okay, the member of this set, the element of this set by x so i can say that x is less than less or equals one and greater or equals zero so in this case in this case i can say that my set here at the page 19 I denote it by capital or calligraphic M. So this set in this sense is bounded, is bounded. If you take, you see, if you take an open interval, zero, one. So the elements zero and one do not belong to our set. It is possible, yes, no problem. In this case, I can say that any element x from this set, any element of this set is less than one and greater than zero. Because, because the point zero and one do not belong to our set you see so in the first case in the first case we had that x was such that x is less or equal one and greater or equals zero in the case of an open interval zero one 
you have that x is strictly less than 1 and strictly greater than 0. Is it clear the difference between two situations? So, so now, now, now I say, I say that if I have that my set capital M is bounded is bounded above you see if you if you take now now i can take the third example for example i can take uh this set minus infinity one so in this case excluding one in this case my set my set is bounded above because all the terms are less than one but it is not bounded below because our left hand side of our the left hand side of our interval is minus infinity so i have a set in this case which is bounded above, but it is not bounded below. Is it clear or not? If you have the question, we can discuss. So you see, you have several types of bounded or unbounded sets. If you have the the set something like a b open or closed with a and b being real numbers without this term plus or minus infinity you have a bounded set if you have the interval something like minus infinity a or a plus infinity these sets are not bound in what sense if i take minus infinity a then this set is bounded from above but is not bounded from below and this set for example a plus infinity is bounded from below but not is, it is not bounded from above is it clear the idea yeah yeah, yeah it's clear really really okay so the definition the least upper bound page 19. we say that the number b is a list upper bound for the set M if if I take you you see the formal definition but I, I, I try to to explain this by hand. So for all for all X from my set M I have that X is less or equals b you see why why we stay in this way so i recall you if you take you see if you take the closed interval zero one see in this case i hope it is clear that maybe the least upper bound for this set is one why because all the elements are less than one except one element x equals one you see and uh, if i take the set the open interval zero one all the elements 
are less than one. And there is no element which is, which equals to one. You see? Is it clear? Rick. Yeah, it's clear. Very. Uh, you see, you see, in this case, uh, I can propose you. You close your eyes, you try to imagine this interval, and you will see that all the elements for the closed interval are less or equal to one. And for open interval, all the elements are really less than one. Clear? Yes. 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 The, second, the second part of this definition, you see, which is important for us, that for each epsilon, greater than zero, there is an element X from my set M such that X is greater than B e minus epsilon. So in order to imagine, in order to imagine this, please close your eyes, and try to imagine the open interval zero one. Okay. So I hope that the least upper bound for this interval is one. But if I take some epsilon, some epsilon positive, and I take the number one minus epsilon so you will have something like an interval in this case zero one minus epsilon then after one minus epsilon we can find we can always find because epsilon is positive we can always find an element which is such that x greater than 1 minus epsilon. So after 1 minus epsilon, we have an element of our, of our open interval, you see, which is greater than 1 minus epsilon. In uh, the same way, we can define the greatest lower bound. Uh, so by the definition, we have that the number A is the greatest lower bound if the first thing that all the elements of our set, each element of our set is greater or equals A, the greatest lower bound. So if you take our interval 0, 1, 0, 1, I hope it is clear for you that the greatest lower bound is 0. So all the elements greater are greater than 0. You see, only in the case when we include the point 0, our interval, for example, for a closed interval, 0, 1, you will have that there exists, there is x from our set, which is 0, and uh, this x is 0. In this case, we have the equality. But the second part of this definition so if I take epsilon greater than zero, we can find we can find an element of our set such that x is less than a plus epsilon. 
So you can imagine if you close your eyes and imagine your open interval zero one. So you take the point in this case zero plus epsilon. So epsilon, then you can find you can always find an element which verifies the second part of our definition. Is it clear? I hope it is not very clear for the moment, but next time we will start with this. We will try to understand the examples. You are tired, it's the first seminar, so Thank you very much, and you are free for this evening. Thank you, thank Eric. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Professor. Yeah. Teacher, I'm Omar, teacher. See, see you, see you next Friday. See you. Okay, okay see you. Goodbye. Ciao, ciao. Mama, <laughs>